Hey Dungeons and Dragons community, I love D&D, and 5th is my favorite edition by far. But that doesn't mean it's perfect, and I think we agree a couple adjustments can make things even better. I've done a series of those adjustments, and I'm providing them to anyone who wants them. There's no cost, feel free to download them, share them, and please use them and let me know how it goes. In these videos, I'm explaining how these adjustments work and why I made the decisions I made for any changes. Today I'm going to go through my changes for 6 level spells. As always, a link to the document is in the video description. Also there is a link to my WordPress account where I've converted all the documents to PDF. Or if you prefer, there is a link to a table of contents that links to the documents. Now with 6 level spells, we are at the level now where the spells are such a high level that things like rangers and paladins can never access these spells. So these are the massively powerful spells. And if we look at the player's handbook, we see lots of examples of six level spells that have absolutely dramatic effects. But then we see some other spells that don't cut it. And those are the spells I wanna focus on today and see if we can make them viable options for casters to give us more options. And I think that's more fun. So today I present six level spells, the Treant Monk variant, Let's get started. So the first spell I want to talk about is Arcane Gate. Now, Arcane Gate is the kind of spell that I tend to like. I like teleportation effects, and Arcane Gate is a pretty substantial teleportation effect because it creates two portals and they remain open, so you can freely go back and forth between them. Now the issues I have with this spell are, number one, it's concentration. So concentration is a big investment for this kind of spell, especially considering most teleportation spells don't require concentration. Uh, I understand why there's concentration, because we are maintaining this effect, uh, and it's a fairly potent effect, teleportation, and we can do it over and over again. So the concentration makes sense to me. Uh, but the other issue I have with this spell is the range. The range is 500 feet, which sounds great, but that 500 feet, it's limited to what you can see. So you have to have both portals within your vision. And generally speaking, if we're adventuring, sometimes we may be out in the open and we can see 500 feet, but a lot of the time, I'd say by far the most of the time, you can't uh, because you're in a dungeon or whatever. And sometimes you can see 20 feet or maybe 50 feet. So this 500 foot range is kind of wasted with Arcane Gate. And it's not like we don't have teleportation effects that don't require a line of sight. I mean, we have Dimension Door. Dimension Door doesn't require line of sight. But Arcane Gate, which is a two level higher spell, does. So I figured that is the solution. So with Arcane Gate, I'm keeping the casting time, the range, the components, and the duration all the same but I have changed the first paragraph. So now you create link teleportation portals that remain open for the duration. Choose two points on the ground within range. So I've removed the line of sight requirement. One point within 10 feet of you and one point within 500 feet of you. A circular portal 10 feet in diameter opens up over each point. If the portal would open in this space occupied by a creature or an object, the spell fails and the casting is lost. Because that's always a danger when you can't see Maybe you're going to cast a spell and it's going to enter a solid rock or something like that. Well, then the spell will not let you do that. Other than that, the spell is going to remain the same. The portals are two-dimensional glowing rings filled with mist, uh, hovering inches above the ground. You can bypass back and forth freely. Uh, so it's just the range I've changed, uh, specifically the line of sight requirement. The next spell I want to talk about is Circle of Death. Uh, Circle of Death, I have big problems with. This is not a spell that I like at all. Uh, the big problem with Circle of Death is that it does 8d6 damage, save for half. It's a constitution saving throw. And that means as a damaging effect, it's worse than Fireball. Now, the advantage you have over Fireball is it is a much bigger area. Circle of Death is a huge area. But it is also friendly fire, so you can't cast it just anywhere. In fact, in a lot of places, you won't be able to cast Circle of Death at all without hitting allies, just because if you are in a room and there's only 60 feet across, then you can't get out of the area of effect. So sometimes that bigger area of effect isn't even an advantage, but sometimes it is. But it certainly doesn't justify three additional levels of casting. 
Uh, generally, with the game, when we look at lower level spells, for example, uh, if we look at, say, Thunder Wave going to Shatter, the area of effect increases and the damage increases. And for some reason, that just didn't happen with Circle of Death. So now we have this sixth level spell doing damage that we would expect from a third level spell. So to me, that's the obvious switch, is Circle of Death just needs to be able to do damage that's appropriate for a sixth level spell. So I've kept the casting time, the range, the components, and the duration all the same. A sphere of negative energy ripples out in a 60-foot radius sphere from a point within range. Each creature in that area must make a constitution saving throw. A target takes 12d6 necrotic damage on a failed save, or half as much on a successful one. Uh, and when you cast a spell using a spell slot of 7th level or higher, damage increases by 2d6 for each slot level above 6th. Now the scaling here I've kept the same, the 2d6 per level. So again, this just makes sense to me. This is a 6th level spell, it's scaling 2d6 per level, so 12d6 is the base damage, 2d6 for each level scaled above that. I think that makes a lot more sense in balancing this to 6th level spells, and I think it makes a lot more sense mathematically as well. The next spell is a spell that I consider to be a circumstantially useful spell, and that's Dromage's Instant Summons. And I may have mispronounced Dromage's, uh, but that's how I read it anyway. Um, and the way this works is you cast it on an object, then you have a sapphire worth at least a thousand gold pieces, you crush the sapphire and the object appears. That can be a useful effect, but a thousand gold pieces to cast this spell uh, is way too much for a circumstantial spell. I mean, this could be a neat spell to use, but you're going to be very hesitant to use a spell that's going to require 1,000 gold pieces to cast every time you cast it. And this isn't like, you know, Circle of Death, where you have a component that you can use over and over again. Every time you cast a spell, the component is lost. So you touch an object weighing 10 pounds or less, whose largest dimension is 6 feet or less. The spell leaves an invisible mark on its surface and invisibly inscribes the name of the item on the gemstone you use as the material component. Uh, so the first thing I've done is I've changed, you don't need a sapphire, you just need a gemstone. Each time you cast a spell, you must use a different gemstone. At any time thereafter, you can use your action to speak the item's name and crush the gemstone. The item instantly appears in your hand regardless of your physical or planar distances and the spell ends, etc, etc. Uh, and then the material component is a gemstone worth at least 100 gold pieces. Now, 100 gold pieces isn't nothing, but it that 1,000 gold piece insane investment to cast this spell uh, just seemed like way too much to me. 100 gold pieces, however, although it's not nothing, it is certainly affordable by the time you get 6 level spells. So this is a spell that you will cast. Uh, and you should be able to cast it. It's a six level spell and you took it. So that is the change I made. Again, it's still a circumstantial spell, uh, but I do think it can be a very good spell. And with a hundred gold piece material component, I'm not gonna be as frightened to cast it. The next spell I wanted to talk about was Find the Path. Uh, now, Find the Path can be a very handy divination spell. The problem with Find the Path is if we are using it in an adventure, so uh, your diviner or whatever you are, a spellcaster who has find the path and you're looking for something and you cast find the path, uh, you can concentrate on it for up to a day. So that could take you right where you need to go. The problem is, of course, if you're concentrating on find the path, you're not going to be much of a spellcaster after that. And that's a problem because then find the path becomes a pretty hard spell to use in actual adventuring. Uh, because as a spellcaster, that's going to be at least 11th level, you want to be able to cast other spells. And when you're limited to non-concentration spells, that is a huge limitation for any kind of spellcaster. Uh, and Find the Path, although it is a pretty good effect, it's not super powerful. It's not like it's telling you how to get around the traps or how to get through the locked door. Uh, it doesn't do those kinds of things. It also doesn't tell you the safest route. It it just gives you the shortest route. Uh, still, very good spell for 6th level, but that concentration is a deal breaker, and that's what needed to go. So now we're going to have the duration of one day, but no concentration. And just to remind you what the spell does, it allows you to find the shortest, most direct physical route to a specified fixed location that you are familiar with on the same plane of existence. So there is some circumstantiality here. This isn't going to get you through the dungeon unless you know the location on the other side. If you name a destination on another plane of existence, a destination that moves, or a destination that isn't specific, the spell fails. But 
If we get the circumstances right, this is an effective spell. For the duration, as long as you are on the same plane of existence as the destination, you know how far it is, you know what direction it lies. While you're traveling there, whenever you're presented with a choice of paths along the way, you automatically determine which path is the shortest and most direct route, but not necessarily the safest route to the destination. So this is a good spell, but the problem is that concentration makes it so that we can't really cast it in most adventuring situations. So removing that concentration is going to give us that option and open up some options for the diviner kind of spellcaster. The next spell I want to talk about is Magic Jar. Now, if you haven't seen, I have a video on Magic Jar uh, where I discuss the mechanics of it. But one of the issues with Magic Jar is what qualifies as a class feature because you retain your class features. And if we take the rules as they're written, your hit points are a class feature. Uh, your hit dice are a class feature. And therefore, if we take Magic Jar exactly as it's written, you would get the hit points of the creature that you uh, Magic Jar, as well as your own hit points. So you would basically add them together. I'm sure that's not the way they intended it to work. I'm sure that's not what they meant by class features. But technically by raw, that's the way it works. Uh, and Magic Jar is already a really good spell. It doesn't need that. That is just, I think, a mistake. And I think a mistake that we can correct right now. So Magic Jar, casting time, duration, all that, the same. Your body falls into a cataconic state as your soul leaves it and enters the container used for the spell's material component. While your soul inhabits the container, you are aware of your surroundings as if you were in the container space. You can't move or take reactions. The only action you can take is to project your soul up to 100 feet out of the container, either returning to your living body and ending the spell or attempting to possess a humanoid body. Now, if you don't know how Magic Jar works, it's a fairly complicated spell. I do, as I said, have an entire video devoted to discussing how Magic Jar works. I'm going to link it up above in case you want to check it out. But for this video, what I want to do is just highlight the change I made. So once you possess a creature's body, you control it. Your game statistics are replaced by the statistics of the creature, though you retain your alignment, your intelligence, your wisdom, and your charisma scores. You retain the benefit of your own class features with the exception of your hit points and hit dice. This is basically, I think, going to make Magic Jar work far more as it was intended to work, rather than that little loophole that allows you to add your hit points together. The next spell I want to talk about is Move Earth. Now, Move Earth, again, is a circumstantial spell. It can be useful, but there is a significant downside to Move Earth, and that is it's really circumstantial. Uh, because what it does is you cast it, it's concentration two hours. That's a really weird duration, uh, but I didn't see any reason we needed to change that. But it's concentration two hours. You choose an area of terrain, and it has to be 40 feet on a side within range, so a pretty big area. And over the next 10 minutes, you reshape dirt, sand, or clay in the area, any manner you choose for the duration. And you can do things like create pits, you can create walls, you can do all kinds of useful things. The problem is, you can reshape dirt, sand, or clay. So if you're in a cave, you can't use it. If you're in a dungeon, you can't use it. Uh, you can use it when you're outdoors. And that's basically it. This is a six level spell. I'm going to be really tempted to not pick a spell that has that circumstantial a use. This is also an out of combat spell, by the way, because it takes 10 minutes for these changes to occur. Uh, so this is really something that I would never take as a spellcaster because that circumstantiality of it is really a deal breaker for me. I figure it needs some way to affect rock. Uh, and that's what I've included here. So I've kept Move Earth the same, but I've added one paragraph. The spell can manipulate natural stone, but the spell may only dig into the stone, creating a five foot square excavation for every 10 minutes concentrating on the spell. So that addition of adding in natural stone is going to mean you can use it in things like caverns. You can use it on the face of a cliff, things that you couldn't do before, uh, but that's still Earth, right? Rock is still Earth. Move Earth, a sixth level spell, should have some effect on Rock. So including that, I think, makes this still a very circumstantial spell, but I think it opens up enough avenues that it would be the spell I would consider. The next spell I want to talk about is Autoluke's Freezing Sphere. Now, I don't hate Autoluke's Freezing Sphere. I actually think it's an okay spell. Uh, I don't think it does a lot of damage, but on the other hand, it has the secondary effects, like 
uh, freezing water. And so there's a battlefield control element as well. So you add those two things together, and I think Autolux Freezing Sphere is an okay spell. There's one problem I have with Autolux Freezing Sphere, and that is it has a 60-foot radius sphere, which is a huge radius. That's nice. But the problem is, is with a statement later in the spell. Uh, so you can refrain from firing the globe after completing the spell if you wish. A small globe the size of a sling stone, cool to the touch, appears in your hand. At any time, you or a creature you give the globe to can throw the globe to a range of 40 feet. That's dumb, because this has a 60-foot radius. So that means you can't even throw it far enough to keep yourself out of the radius. Uh, and that doesn't make any sense. It, that shouldn't even be in there. I wonder if when they wrote the spell, they forgot it was a 60-foot radius, or maybe they changed it to a 60-foot radius later and forgot to change the range that you can throw it. But that's a problem. If you're going to give somebody the ability to throw the stone, you should be able to throw it far enough that you don't blow yourself up. So that's the fix. Uh, so what I've done now is you can hurl the stone up to 80 feet. So now you can safely hurl it far enough that you're not going to blow yourself up anymore. Uh, otherwise, kept the spell the same as I said. It's not an amazing spell, but I think it's an okay spell. Uh, the damage is not great, but that secondary effect I think can make it a worthwhile spell. The next spell I'm going to talk about is a little bit controversial because there are people who disagree with me about this spell. But I think Otto's Irresistible Dance, as written in the player's handbook, is a terrible spell. What it does is you cast it on somebody, uh, they have disadvantage on their attack rolls, you have advantage against attack rolls against them, and they get a save every round to get rid of the effect. So this is very similar to the restrained condition. It's not technically the restrained condition, but it essentially ends up being the same thing. So the restrained condition, or what is effectively the restrained condition, I don't know why they didn't call it the restraint condition, it's basically the same, but um, the restraint condition is no big deal for a six level spell. Uh, now, the advantage here is, number one, they don't get a save when you first cast the spell, and number two, they have to use their action to make a save on following rounds. But as I said, restraint isn't necessarily a deal breaker. I mean, if you're a dragon, you can be restrained and you can still use your breath weapon. If you're a spellcaster, you can be restrained and you can still cast spells. So somebody who's under the effect of Otto's Irresistible Dance can still do lots of useful things on their turn if they don't care too much about disadvantage on attack rolls. Now you have advantage on attacks against them, but I mean, you can get advantage on attacks against somebody with first level spells. Uh, now, technically speaking, there's no save on the first round, but a one round effect of essentially restrained is nothing. So this is a spell that needed something else. Uh, so Otto's Irresistible Dance now, the change I've made is actually fairly subtle, but I think it really makes it a better spell. Choose one creature you can see within range. That target begins a comic dance in place, shuffling, tapping its feet, and capering for the duration. Creatures that can't be charmed are immune to the spell. That's the same. A dancing creature must use all its movement and its action to dance without leaving its space and has disadvantage on dexterity saving throws and attack rolls. While the target is affected by the spell, other creatures have advantage on attack rolls against it. At the end of each of its turns, a dancing creature makes a wisdom saving throw to regain control of itself. On a successful save, the spell ends. So the change here basically is, in most cases, this might actually work the same as the spell in the player's handbook. The difference is that you can't have that spellcaster choose to cast a spell rather than making a saving throw. You can't have that dragon choose to use their breath weapon instead of making a saving throw. They're going to get their saving throw, but they're going to give up their action automatically. So this isn't a huge boost to this. This just takes out that little loophole that I had a problem with where I found that sometimes this spell didn't operate the way that I thought it should. Now I think it does. And I think it's perfectly appropriate that you would use your action for the dancing anyways. The next spell I want to talk about is Wall of Ice. Now, if we are a caster and we have reached 11th level, we've already had wall spells for a couple levels. Uh, really great spells like Wall of Force, or if we're a different caster, Wall of Stone. The advantage of Wall of Ice is some damage that it does. But we are giving up a full spell level for that damage. Now, when you cast this spell, uh, if a creature is in the area, they make a dexterity saving throw. And on a failed save, they take 10d6 cold damage, which isn't a huge deal for a 6 level spell. But again, if we have a secondary effect, this is the same as with uh, the Freezing Sphere spell we just talked about. If we have a secondary effect, then suddenly 10d6 is okay. 
Uh, so we do 10d6 cold damage or half as much on a successful save. The problem is, is then once you have the wall and somebody goes through it, uh, then they make a constitution saving throw. And on a failed save, they take 5d6 cold damage. And 5d6 cold damage for a 6th level spell is terrible. So other than the very initial damage, this just becomes an inferior wall spell to the wall spells we could cast with lower level spells. So as far as I'm concerned, the solution here is to make sure that Wall of Ice is at least a somewhat effective damage spell. Uh, so we get that initial 10d6 damage, and then what I've done is when we go through the wall, we're going to increase the damage there. So the wall is an object that can be damaged and thus breached. It has an AC of 12, 30 hit points per 10 foot section, and it's vulnerable to fire damage. Reducing a 10 foot section of wall to zero hit points destroys it and leaves behind a sheet of frigid air in the space the wall occupied. A creature moving through this sheet of frigid air for the first time on a turn must make a constitution saving throw. That creature takes 10d6 cold damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. So the damage is increased when they breach the wall, uh, though I've cut the damage the same when they're in the wall space in the first place, and I've made those damages the same. So it's a simpler spell to use. The last change I've made is the way the spell scales. Uh, and normally when you scale this spell, the damage from the initial effect increases by 2d6 per spell level. The damage from the moving through the frigid air increases by 1d6 per spell level. Uh, but since I've made the damages the same, I'm going to have them scale the same as well. So now when you cast a spell using a spell slot of seventh level or higher, the damage the wall deals when it appears, as well as the damage from passing through the sheet of frigid air, increases by 2d6 for each slot level above 6th. The next spell I want to talk about is actually fairly similar to Wall of Ice, and that's Wall of Thorns. Uh, and Wall of Thorns, like Wall of Ice, you cast it, it appears, creatures in the area where it appears take initial damage, and they also take damage for moving through it. Unlike with Wall of Ice, you don't breach it, uh, instead you have a slower movement rate moving through it. So when I think about this spell, I think of myself, and I've certainly had cases, especially as a kid, where I was moving through brush and you end up with some thorny bushes. And it hurts, uh, but the very first thing you do when you discover it hurts is you stop moving. And then it stops poking you, right? Uh, and then as soon as you start moving again, there's that pain. So that's the way I kind of figure it should work. So when I looked at Wall of Thorns, I thought the initial damage... I didn't really want to change that uh, because we're talking about putting it on top of a creature and assumably they stop moving. Uh, so they're going to take that initial damage, but it's not going to be as bad. But if they're going to just push their way through this thing, it's going to tear them up. And so that's what I've done here is so we're going to create a wall of tough, pliable, tangled brush bristling with needle sharp thorns. The wall appears within range on a solid surface and lasts for the duration. You can choose to make the wall up to 60 feet long, 10 feet high, 5 feet thick, or a circle that has a 20 foot diameter and is up to 20 feet high and 5 feet thick. The wall blocks line of sight. So that's the same. When the wall appears, each creature within the area must make a dexterity saving throw. On a failed save, a creature takes 78 piercing damage or half as much on a successful one. So that is also the same. A creature can move through the wall, albeit slowly and painfully. For every one foot a creature moves through the wall, it must spend four feet of movement. Furthermore, whenever a creature enters a space occupied by the wall, the creature must make a dexterity saving throw. It takes 10d8 slashing damage on a failed save, or half as much damage on a successful one. So, um, just imagine it this way. The, the way it worked before is whenever you enter the wall, you take the damage, and if you end your turn there, you take the damage. We are going to give you an option here. You could remain perfectly still, and if you remain perfectly still, you're not going to take damage. But whenever you move through the wall, you're going to take the damage. And if you move through multiple squares of the wall, you're going to take damage multiple times. So I think that adds a little bit here so that if you were to, say, have a wall of thorns occupying maybe a hallway, and people are moving through it, uh, even if they have a high rate of movement, they should take the damage more than once if they're moving through multiple squares of this uh, wall. So that's the change here is uh, we're not going to give you damage anymore at the end of your turn, but you're going to take damage every time you move through it. And for every square you move through, you're going to take the damage again. And the damage I've increased to 10d8. 
And then at higher levels, when you cast a spell using a spell slot of 7th level or higher, both types of damage increase by 1d8 for each slot level above 6th. So that is all the changes I made for 6th level spells. Next week, I am going to be returning to feats, and we're going to talk about feats again, because I've made some revisions to my feat uh, variant, so I want to go through those with you. And then we will get back into spells, and we'll talk about 7th level spells on the following week. So until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun, because D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everyone, and I will see you next week. Mm -hmm.